I want to talk to you about the principle of preeminence. And if you don't get this, you will struggle in your faith from now on. This is so fundamental. It is so basic, but yet so hard for people seemingly to get their head around. And we're going to look to Matthew 6, 33 and Colossians 1, 18. Father, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you, Lord, for already what you have done, what you have reminded us of, and how you've moved. We say thank you for that. We don't ever take that for granted. And Lord, now for the next moments as we open the holy, eternal word of the living God, I ask you to anoint us together. Help me, Father, to speak it as you want it spoken, and help us together to hear it and understand it by the grace of your Spirit. And we pray that as we render ourselves to you, and we do that in Jesus' name. And once again, everybody said amen. amen. This is what the Holy Bible said. I just want you to hear the Word of God today. Matthew 6.33 Jesus said, but seek ye, if you got nothing else to do, if you're not busy, if you're not tired, the head of the church said, seek ye first. You know, a lot of times people struggle in their faith, and oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes it can be traced right back to the fact that Jesus is not first place in their life. Churchgoers. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We're in a kingdom here on this earth, and it's not an earthly kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The word righteousness is the Greek word dikasune. It means to be right with God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and to be right with him. And all these things will be added to you. Now, when we don't seek first the kingdom of God, you can get mad at me if you want to. If you don't seek first the kingdom of God and you're out chasing these things, then you obviously don't trust God's add-on plan for your life. A amen. I can amen myself. I've done it before. It's truth. This is what Jesus said. Seek first the kingdom and, and to be right with him. And all these things, these things that you need in life, these things of life, will be added to you. Now, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, and he is the head of the body, speaking of Jesus. Jesus is the head of the body, the church, who, speaking of Jesus, is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. Now, listen carefully, that in some things, that in all things. All things. We live in a country where in recent years, and it's always been, but it seems to have accelerated, where humanity, where people have created a God that thinks like they think. And they live in fantasy. This is the head of the church we're talking about. That in everything, in every aspect of your life, in all things, he might have the preeminence. Now, once again, the simplicity of true Christian living is revealed in this, this powerful revelation. And it's so simple to see, and yet it seems so complex and difficult for people to apply to how they live. And I want you to understand, if you can get this, if you can apply this to your life and to where it just becomes the way you live, you won't be chasing stuff anymore. Stuff will chase you. The things that you want to make your life complete, you won't have to chase them. They'll chase you. I know what I'm telling you is the truth. So seek first, not second, 
not third, not fifth, but seek first. The word means first in time, in place, in order of importance, or at the beginning. Seek for the most important influence in your life first. The kingdom of God and to be right with him. You know, I found out there's times in order to be right with him, I'm going to upset somebody. But I got to seek first to be right with him. So he's got to have preeminence, the Bible said. And the scripture's crystal clear. The word preeminence here means to be first in rank or influence. Who influences you the most? Could be your spouse. Could be your boss. Could be the bottom line in your checking account. Could be in your wild dreams of what you want to do with your life. Who influences you first? Now, the good godly answer on a Sunday morning in a place like this would be Jesus. But for real, who do you seek first? Romans 10 and 9, this is the, the, the fundamental idea of salvation. Romans 10 and 9 said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. How is a person saved? They got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he rose from the dead. And then they have to confess him as Lord. Curios, master controller. Now, how many of you know that, that there's a very fine line? There's a lot of people that will tell you once you come to Jesus, you're free to do anything you want to do. That is heretical. It is a lie. It is not truth. Because the Bible said in Romans, what are y'all looking at me like that for? You ought to know better than that. Romans 6 and 18 said, being then made free from sin, you became the servants. Somebody said slaves, that's what the word means. You became the servants of righteousness, seeking first to be right with God. So what I've got to understand in order for me to be saved, there is this decision that Jesus is Lord of my life. And then what I ought to do as a disciple, when I encounter things in my own life that conflict with the Word of God, I cast down those understandings and I put in the Word of God. I renew my mind. That's what discipleship is. So that I can continue to grow in my faith. But it begins from this premise of His Lordship. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. Hmm. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that does my will. You know, sometimes I feel like the urgency of preaching the gospel of Christ is preaching to people lest they die. And I'm telling you what Jesus said. This is him talking. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, there is, a, there is a doctrine. I'm going to talk to you about this sometime in the very near future. There is a doctrine that, that says you just pray a prayer and go on live any way you want to. You've got a free ticket to ride. And it doesn't matter what you do because everything is for your pleasure. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he that doeth the will of the Father in heaven, those are those that enter into the kingdom. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day. These are some of the most sobering words you'll read in the Bible. They will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name we have cast out devils. And in your name we've done many wonderful works. And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I want you to have ears to hear what the Bible says. Again, this is Jesus talking. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, 
and do not the things which I say. It's easy for us to get on our church mask when we come to church on Sunday. Put our praise on and, and, you know, we know how to do church. But he said, why do you call me Lord, Master Controller, and you don't even do what I say? Sobering words. So the principle of preeminence, which is all throughout the Bible, is paramount to my walk of faith. Now, consider this with me. First, in the Old Testament, Exodus 20 and 3, God said, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods, nothing else you worship before me. In Isaiah 45, 18, he said, I am the Lord and there is none else. Isaiah 45, 21, and there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none but me. That's what God said about himself. So I'm telling you this God of the Bible demands to be first. So putting anything or anybody or any pleasure or any emotion, anything before him is idolatry. He demands to be first. Now in the New Testament, let's listen to Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 26, beginning, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and his sisters and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now again, that word hate in this context, miseo, it means to love less. So what he's saying is, you got to love him more than anybody. Because the one you love the most is the one that will have influence over your life. That's what Jesus said. He goes on in, in verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now see, this, is, this sounds tough to a lot of people in 2021, but this is fundamental in the Bible. You got to take up your cross. What did Jesus do on the cross? He died. But before he got to the cross, he laid down his life, his, his, his life in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, there he is. And he is praying, and his sweat will become as great drops of blood, and the, the strain and the stress and the burden is extraordinary. And he says to God, Abba, Father, take this cup from me. Jesus knew what was about to happen to him. Take this cup from me. Ha ah, ha, but nevertheless... Not what I will, but what you will. Now, my brothers and sisters, here is something for us to learn. Jesus, this is all recorded for our benefit. Jesus, by the will of God, was about to step into something that was at not at the top of his list that he wanted to do. And he said, Father, take this from me. Ah, but nevertheless, not what I want but what you want. Next time you're singing to be like Jesus, that's all I ask. Next time you're singing, I want to be more like him. You need to think about this. Because what he did, he gave his mind, will, emotions, his personality, his plans and dreams, his agenda. He gave that all to God in the nevertheless now, let me remind you that Jesus said in John 4, 34, my meat, my food, is to do the will of who? Him that sent me. Do you want to be like Jesus? For real? The Bible said this in John 6, 38, I have come to do the will of him that sent me. He's saying my whole life is about getting God what he wants out of me. That's what Jesus said. Now, so he says, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And where did that take him? That took him to the cross. The result of that was you and I could now have everlasting life. What about the Apostle Paul? 
He said in Galatians 2, 19, beginning, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Now, this doesn't sound much to me like some of the garbage I hear today called doctrine from different sources. This says you come and pray and do anything you want to. No. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you understand what he's saying? I'm crucified with Christ. So now he is going to live through me. He's going to touch through me. He's going to speak through me. He's going to do his work through me. Because the life that I'm living in the flesh, I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. Paul said that. So it wasn't difficult for him with that understanding. 2 Timothy 4 and 6, when he's in a Roman jail awaiting a second hearing before Nero that he knew would bring inevitable death. And he would say, I'm ready to be offered. I'm ready to be poured out. See, there's something about putting him first. You take up your cross and follow him, he said, or you can't be my disciple. He goes on in the same chapter in verse 33 and said, whosoever he have you, is my mic cutting out? Uh, can somebody get me a handheld? If, if, can somebody, if they're back here somewhere. Whoever he be among you that will, listen, will not forsake everything that he has. He cannot be my disciple. Now those are pretty strong words. He cannot be my disciple. What, what, what do I have to do? Remember, if, if, if I love anybody more than him, I can't be his disciple. Now, I can act like it, and I can go to church and talk church talk. I can create my own idea of God, but this is the head of the church talking. Can't love anybody more. And then he says, you got to be willing to forsake everything. That means if I love stuff, things, Money, more than him, I can't be his disciple. He's got to be first. Again, back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything, in everything, so that in everything he might have supremacy or preeminence. He is Incredible. He's incredible. Matthew 27, 37, beginning. Jesus replied, now again, this is Jesus talking. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. Mark 13, or 12 and 30 added, with all of your strength. All of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. If I love him with all that, that don't leave much left, does it? Now again, this is right out of your Bible. Jesus said that. So he must be first in everything. In, in, in everything. I got to love him with all of my heart. Now I want you to listen to me. Your heart is the real you. In Proverbs 27 and 19, the Bible says that face answers to face in a reflection of water. And so the heart of man to man. In other words, if you want to see what you look like out, out here, look in a mirror or look into a pool of water and you'll see your reflection. If you want to know who you really are, for real, who you are, look at your heart. 
And so he said, love him with all of who you are. Not just on Sunday. Not just if you just feel inclined to put in a CD sometime during the week. Loving with all your heart, loving with all your soul. That's the Greek word suke, mind, will, emotion, seat of personality. All of my agendas, the real me, the self me. I got to love him with all. What do you think would happen if everybody that said they're a Christian lived like this? Love him with all your mind. The word means understanding or the way that we think. Love him with all of your thinking. And love him with all your strength. That word means what you do. So love him from the real you. Love him from the self-man. Love him from your understanding and how you think. And love him in what you do. This is what the Bible says teaches us and how we how we interact with him because he's incredible that's why that's why in revelation 2 4 jesus said you have left your first love he said i got this against you you've left your first love you left it you neglected it you disregarded it you guys got a phone becky you got you got your phone somebody bring me a phone and turn it off or down because I have friends that will call. Done that myself before. So here's the deal. If I'm walking with God and he's got my ear every day of my life, it's like this. And even though you all may start screaming and hooping and hollering, I'm still going to hear what's coming out of this. But then if I, if I lay this down and maybe I can turn it on speaker, then maybe I can step here and I can hear it. But then what happens if I move a little further away and y'all are making noise and people are speaking and yelling and and I move a little further away, before too long, I can't hear that anymore. I'm hearing this. I'm hearing what's around me. And what happens to people that, that, that at a point in time, they're hungry after God. They're giving time to their devotion, their personal growth. They're living their life asking, God, what do you want of me? And that's how they live. Every decision goes through the filter Of in all things, he has to be first. But then when you maybe stop praying, or you get a little further away from God, and and, and you get a little further away from God, I'm telling you, before too long, you have drifted so far from God, to go back and do the way and live the way you used to live is absurd to you. You mean to go, I've heard people that for years... They'd go to church three and four times a week. They'd worship. They'd cry. They'd magnify the Lord. And now they are the same people saying, well, I don't need that to go to church every week. You know why? Because they've drifted so far from God, they can't even hear him. Yeah. Amen. Get mad at me if you will, but I'm telling you, take it to the Lord. This is fundamental to our faith. And I want to declare this to you again. He must be first in every thing. And what did Jesus say to do to that church in Ephesus? He told them to remember. This is how you, if you leave your first love, this is what you do. Remember from whence you are fallen. It, something in my heart breaks when I, when I hear him describe neglecting your first love as falling. Remember. From whence you're fallen. Remember how you used to be. And repent. Turn around and do the first works. Go get the foundation set again. Because in all things he has to be, he has to be first. Second Corinthians 8 and 5 of the Macedonians, the Bible said they first gave themselves themselves to the Lord. Now, that's the way it's supposed to be. The principle of preeminence begins with giving yourself to the Lord because if you give yourself to the Lord and you put him first, there won't be any eclipses, spiritual eclipses in your life. Nothing's going to get between you and him. If you hold back 
There's always going to be things that take his place. You know, it's interesting to me. I was, uh, I was reading in Judges chapter 8. You remember the story of Gideon? Gideon was behind the wine press and the Midianites had filled the land and Gideon's over here trying to get something to eat, sneaking around and the angel showed up and said, hey, you mighty man of God. And Gideon's like, me? And he, and he begins to speak to Gideon and, and, and give direction to Gideon. Gideon went and, and these thousands of people were going to come with him. God said, that's too much. Tell everybody that's afraid to go home. That was still too many. Then God whittled it down to 300. And Gideon with his 300 went and, and came against the Midianites, ran them off. It was a, it was a massive, one-sided, lopsided victory. When it was over, the people said to Gideon, rule over us. Gideon said, not me, not me, not my sons, but the Lord is going to rule over you. And then Gideon, who was well-intentioned, said, why don't you give me all the golden earrings we got from the battle, the spoil. And so they brought all the gold, and it was a lot, and he made a golden ephod out of it. He wanted to commemorate and memorialize this great victory. So he set it up, and the Bible said that Israel went a whoring. That's a good, I think, King James Version. They played the harlot. In other words, they begin to practice idolatry over this thing that was set up to remind them of the victory that God gave. And the Bible said, and it snared Gideon. I'm telling you that happens so much. If I am not intent about keeping God first in my life, the very blessings of God can become a snare to me. You know, I've seen people through the years need a job. They were, they were destitute. And they begin to pray, oh God, oh God, oh God. And they cried out to God and God made a way and they started making big money. And then before too long came the boat, and I'm not preaching against boats, for too long came the big motorhome. Not, I'm not preaching against that. Before too long, options, and I'm telling you, if you've been blessed financially, you got options, and you better be careful. Because then before too long, well, I can't. I remember one particular guy, hadn't been in church in three or four weeks. Well, man, I called him. Where, where you been, man? I missed you. Well, we've been down on the lake, and we've been here. And over the course of time, that man lost he just fell backwards away from God because something else became a God to him. And I'm telling you, sometimes if you're not careful, the very blessings of God can become a snare to you. Amen? You're going to be glad to see me go, aren't you? He demands to be first. The New Testament church met the first day of every week. In my mind, Sunday starts my week. He wants, he wants it. He wants the first part of everything. Hmm. He, wants to be, he wants the first part of your day. He wants the first part of the week. He wants the first part of your meal. That's when you stop and thank him for what you're about to eat. He wants the first part of your money. He wants the first part of your relationship. Because if he's not first in that relationship, it can go in places that will become a snare to you. He demands to be first. I can't flippantly live my life in a way where, oh, well, I don't have time for that or this. Or, and then I'm wondering through life, wondering where is the blessings of God in my life? Well, the answer to that is, where have you put God in your life? Just telling you the Bible. And then there was first fruits. Because this is all through the Bible. God demands to be first. Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits, that's the best of the land, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. That's what God said long before anybody made a law or talked about anything else. He said that. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your substance. Do you realize, at least in my mind, when I am tithing and giving offerings to God, I'm honoring him. 
I'm honoring him because he has strengthened my hands. I'm honoring him because he redeemed me. You know what that means? He purchased me. If you're a Christian, he purchased you at Calvary. And so everything you are, everything you possess belongs to him. If I'm redeemed. Why is it getting so restless in here? I'm just telling you the truth. He's got to be first. And he says, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits. It's the Hebrew word resheath. It means the first, the beginning, the first part of all of your increase. The word means income, produce, gain, revenue. Somebody said, well, I don't have a grain field to bring to the Lord. The word means income as well. Verse 10, the response, the result, so shall your barns, your storehouse, be filled with plenty, overflowing in, with abundance, it means, and your precious shall burst out with new wine. When Joshua came out of Gilgal and he headed for the promised land, the first city in front of him was what? It's a quiz. I just preached just a few weeks ago. See if anybody pays attention. Does anybody know? Jericho, somebody said over here. So they're coming out of Gilgal, and the first war, the first battle is Jericho. And do you know that there would be 10 major military campaigns for Joshua? 31 kings would fall at his hand. This is the first. He's got no idea what lies ahead. And God said, I want you to take all the gold and the silver... And I want you to bring them into the storehouse of the Lord. God said, it's mine. I want all the gold and the silver. He didn't ask that of the second battle or the third or the sixth or the ninth or the tenth. There were ten battles. He said, I want the gold and the silver from the first one. Now, Joshua had no idea that, but what God was going to do that every battle. And if that was the case, who's going to finance the war? But this was the only time God asked for that. The only time. He wanted the first. And in this case, it was the tenth. Now, 2,500 years before the law, Genesis 4.3 said, In the course of time, Cain brought forth some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of the flock. He's bringing the first and the best. Cain just brought some fruits from the soil. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was angry. Cain looked at Abel. Why is Abel getting such a blessing? And I'm not. He was mad. And his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not what is right, sin crouches at the door and it desires to have you. You must master it. Abel brought the first and the best. I'm just telling you the facts. Cain just brought some of the offering from the ground. And God looked with favor on Abel because God demands to be first. Now you can say, well, it's the law of, of, of Abraham. It's the covenant of Moses. And this is long before all that because this is who God is. Now, you know, what's important um, when you look at it, Leviticus 27, 30 said, all the tithe of the land, whether it be seed of the land or fruit of the tree, is the Lord's and it's holy under the Lord. So the tithe has to be first. I was telling you, the tithe has to be first. Ten people come up here. Let's do it. I've done this before. Ten people. You guys, come on. Just come on. Rocky, come on. Don't hesitate. I just need ten. I just need ten. I appreciate the fact that four or five of you are coming. I just need, I need four, five, six, seven, eight. I just need two more people. Thank you, Chad. And come on. Yeah, that's good. I think it's it. I don't need more than ten. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. Do I just have nine? Ten. Who wants to be the tithe? All right, Jeff, you're going to be the tithe. 
Now, let's just say this represents your income. Let's just say it's $1,000 for you, whether it's a week or a month or whatever. Let's say your income is $1,000. Who can tell me how many of these people make up the tithe? One. So you want to be the tithe? Go sit down. Because the tithe is the first one to go. See, I know that makes some of you happy and others of you don't. Because what we do, we give, we give what is hallowed and holy to the electric company. We give it to the cable company. Oh, dear God, help me. Oh, Pastor, I'm struggling. I got a $180 cable bill. <laughs> Guess what? You can fix that. Okay, I can't get stuck there. I can't get stuck there. So this is, this is God's way. God says, I want the first. Because the first blesses the rest. Oh. Are you guys feeling what I feel? You see, you see what, I gotta, what I gotta fight when I'm talking about stuff like this. So then here's what happens. We gotta, we gotta pay the mortgage. So there they go. Well, y'all go with him. You gotta pay the mortgage, and then you got, you got a car payment, and, and car payment, and you got, you know, utilities and all that stuff, and, and you gotta eat, right? Amen. And so, so you're managing your life. No, you guys are gone. You went with the, you went with the house payment. And so, so, You've done right before God, and you got these other needs, but then some, some, something you didn't expect comes up. And you're looking over here, and so a portion of this is saved. So you got to save. And so, but even with your savings, you got this, this other. You've bought your groceries and your things you got to have, and... What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I've done this. I've, I've given this. I've done what I'm supposed to do. And I've just got, oh, look, where did this come from? Suddenly, he, he may show up in the mail. He may show up through a family member. He may show up through some other something, some inheritance somewhere. He may show up in something along the journey. But here he is. Why? Because the first blesses the rest. And while I'm at it, Malachi 3.10 said, uh, bring the tithe in the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And God said, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out blessing. Just pour out blessing uh, that there's not room uh, to receive. Uh, now you may say, is that always money? No, that's sometimes when you were sick and God healed you and you didn't have to go to the doctor. That's sometimes uh, when your car was making a noise, but you laid hands on it, and it just quit. We've prayed over washing machines. We've prayed over dryers. We've prayed over refrigerators. We've prayed over cars. We've driven with no gas. I'm telling you, there will be an open heaven. All right, now you guys can go consume it on yourself. It becomes a lifestyle. Putting God first in everything. Because the first blesses the rest. What happened to Israel when God said, I want all the gold and silver from this first battle from Jericho. But after they had won, they went to the next place at Ai, and they got whipped. And they came back, something's not right. Joshua goes before the Lord, something's not right. We overcame Jericho, and now we go to Ai, and we should wipe them out, but they, they, they whipped us. And God says, bring everybody together. 
family by family, person by person. And they got to Achan. And here Achan was. He had a stylish Babylonian garment. What, this is the insanity of greed and sin. What in the world are you going to do with a stylish Babylonian garment in the, the camp of the Israelites? They'd stone you if you put that on. But he's got that. And he buried gold and silver in the earth in the midst of his tent. So when they discovered that, they fixed it, and things did not go well for Achan. And once they fixed it, then from that point forward, victories came. You got to put God first. Not to get anything from him, but just because he's God. Because Jesus is Lord of everything in my life. Listen to this. Then shall you say before the Lord, this is because this is who God is, Deuteronomy 26, 13, beginning. Then shall you say before the Lord your God, I've brought away the hallowed things out of my house. One translation said, I've removed from my house the sacred portion and have given it. I've not eaten of it in my mourning. Neither have I taken anything away for an unclean use, nor given for the dead. But I have hearkened to the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that you commanded me. He said, I've not eaten it. I've not taken any of it for unclean uses. I haven't even paid funeral bills with it. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people, the land that you have given to us. And as you swear by our fathers, a land that flows with milk and honey. The department store should never have my tithe. Gas company should never have my tithe because it's not mine, it's his. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm just trying to help you. A lot of times people are looking to blame the devil for a whole lot of things when it's our own disobedience that's causing us trouble because God loves us and he'll chase on us. Let me give you this in closing. Matthew 6, 24, beginning, no one can serve or be a slave to two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other. In other words, he'll love less or he'll love more. Or he will be devoted to hold to the one and despise or think against or disesteem the other. You cannot serve, you cannot be a slave to both God and money, a mammon of greed, of wealth. You don't have to have a lot of money to be greedy. Now, if you're, if you're here for the first time today, I don't, I don't talk about money much. But it's in the Bible, by the by. And you can't serve God and be a slave to money. Therefore, I tell you, Jesus said, do not worry, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Why do you worry about your clothes? See how the little fields are, are, are clothed they don't labor or spin yet I tell you not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these if that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire will he not much more everybody say much more clothe you O oh, you of little faith so Jesus when he's talking to people that were struggling with, we, with greed, wealth, and money in the place of God, he said they had little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things they desire and crave. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Mm, but seek ye first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. Hmm. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble (laughs) of its own. All things will be added. All things will be added. All things will be added. You know, I tell you, I've, you've heard all of my stories by now. But I, I'll forever understand something that has impacted my life. And I didn't even know it happened. And I told you I had, had my boys record my father a couple of years before he died. Just had him talk. Said, just talk. Talk about the war because he never would. Talk about the war. Talk about when you were young and a, and a child and growing up. And tell us about some of those family members that we'll never really know. Tell us about them so we can remember them. And, and he just sat down and started talking. And I just, I, I came in the room. that We did it, and I think it was in our bedroom. And they had him sitting over there and had some lights and a, and a microphone. And I just wandered in and sat over here in the corner. And I heard him talk. And he said, he said, he was talking about when he got saved. He said, I was getting a bonus from work. He said, and I put a down payment on a, a trailer. Motor, I don't know if it's a motor home or a, but he said, I put a down payment on that. He said, so I decided that I was going to take the whole family out to Idaho. He was going to show us where he worked at when he was a young man. And he stopped and he kind of cocked his head and touched his chin and you know, I'm just sitting over there listening. He laughed and he said, the Lord spoke to me. This is a new believer. To take that money I was going to use to buy that and give it to the church. And he said, so I, I, I gave it to the church. And he touched his chin and he said, I never made it to Idaho. I almost come undone. I jumped up and said, yes, you did. Yes, you did. Because that's the first place I stood in front of living people and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was in Idaho. And I thought, I would have never known that had he not said that. But he made a decision in his life when I was five years old. He made a decision like that. And God has a funny way of doing things sometimes. And so then, 17 years later, I'm standing out in Nampa, Idaho, just outside of Boise. I have no idea how I got there, except by God. I'm standing out there and preaching. It's the first time I ever preached. It was 1979, Friday the 13th. It was July 13th. What's the day today? It's close. Yeah. First time I ever preached. And I have no doubt in my mind I stood there by the providence of God from a seed that my father liberally planted a long time ago. And I'm telling you, in your living and some of the stuff in this world that seems so appealing to us just to make the decision. Because there comes a point in time that you don't have to think about this all the time. It just becomes part of who you are. That you live your life. You know, a preacher say to me, you know, I'm, I'm at a place in life, got a strong church. I could, I could go anywhere. I'm trying to figure out where I want to move to and I'll swap churches with somebody. And I thought, I have never had that liberty. I couldn't do that. Because I'm bound to do the will of him that sent me and get out of my life what he wants. And you might say, well, you're a preacher. Well, listen to me. I don't care who you are or what you do as a believer. That's why we live. And that's why you can never make a major life decision without filtering it through prayer and seeking the face of God. Amen to that. That'll save you a lot of pain along the way. Stand with me, please, everybody. You know, sometimes I feel like I need to say this to you. 
It might feel like I'm preaching mad. I'm not preaching mad. I, I love you. I love God. I have extraordinary passion about these things. Because I know this thing called faith is real. I know that. I've seen too many things. I've, I've, I, know, I know too much about it. I'm, so I'm not up here trying to scold anybody. I'm up here trying to tell you there's a better way. And there's a way of life. And if you study this book, just put him first in everything. Put him first in your marriage. You'll have a better marriage. Put him first in your whatever job you have. The Bible's got something to say. Oh, yeah, the Bible's got a lot to say about work ethic. Well, it speaks to life. The principle of preeminence. And I'm telling you, if you're like one of multitudes of people who just kind of live and as the wind blows, that's how they move. Sometimes they do right and sometimes they don't then you're going to have frustration one after the other. You're going to struggle to feel satisfied and complete in your walk with God. And what we do, if we don't feel that completeness, well, we'll change husbands or wives. We'll change churches. We'll change jobs. We'll change whatever you want to change. And you get there on the other side of that, and lo and behold, you feel the same way you did before. Why? Because the problem was not out here. It's in here. Amen. It is. Try him. Try him. Listen, if he's over here talking and you're goofing around over here somewhere, you can't even hear him. And when somebody's on the phone over there telling you what he's saying, you won't believe him when you get so far away. you got to come and seek first the kingdom of God. And the closer you get to him, the more clearly you can hear what he's got to say. Amen. I feel like we can do this all over the sanctuary. Put him first. Put him first in your family. Put him first. Tell somebody, put him first. I want you to catch hands with somebody if you, if you feel comfortable doing that. If not, just step away from them. If they got something. You know, I grew up in a house where the Lord was first. And I remember my father told me I was nearly grown. I was home for college. And he walked in there. I'd been in bed for two hours. He came in on a Sunday morning. I came home from college and told me, that, you know, we go to church here. You sleep in my house on Saturday night. We're going to church on Sunday morning. And I tried to reject that, but I ended up in church that morning. And I didn't like it a little bit. And there were times in my life I didn't like it. We raised our sons like that. They didn't always want to be in church. But you know what? All three of them are there now. If you're one of these people, dear God, please never say this to me or around me. I won't be responsible for what I do. I heard one person say it once. And I, mm, I had to run away. I'm a little older now. And old people have a hard time doing that said, well, you know, I don't make little Johnny go to church because I don't want to shove religion down his throat. And I'm thinking, you, you send little Johnny off to school every day? You don't think they're shoving stuff down his throat everywhere he goes? You little Johnny sitting there and watch TV? You don't think they're shoving stuff down his throat? Baby, you better shove it as long and as hard as you can. As long as you can. They'll get it. Okay. I just come out. <laughs> it's in there. Lift your hands up, united together. Father, Lord, you love us, and you have declared truth for us. And Lord, you've revealed yourself from the beginning of time until this very day in our new covenant that in all things you have to be first. In everything you have to be first. And so, Lord, I pray today, let decisions be made from people who love you to take a fresh look at how they govern their lives, to take a fresh look at every component and facet of their life 
so that they might make a decision on the inside that will be demonstrated on the outside. And so, Lord, when we put you first, that means that sometimes we say no to things. When we put you first, Lord, there's sometimes we do things we don't want to do. But, Lord, when we put you first and give you preeminence in everything, when we seek you first, Lord, we understand that we're walking in covenant with you. And it's pleasing to you because all things, including us, were created for your pleasure. Lord, speak to us, strengthen us, help us to understand, to live out the principle of preeminence. And we pray that, Jesus, in your holy name. We pray it in the name of Christ. And we believe you for it. We believe you for change and modification in our living. And everybody in the room said amen.